Hello, everybody, and welcome to My Thoughts Exactly. We have a really great show for you today. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour to the Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and we'll chat with the executive director. So we have a big show, so let's get started while I finish my coffee and I bite into this amazing chocolate-covered macaroon from Stork's Bakery in downtown Wilton Manors. Yum. See you later. Bye. Mm. Here we are outside the Stonewall National Museum and Archives, and we're about to go inside and get a wonderful tour with the executive director, Hunter Ohanian. And we're going to talk with him all about the museum and see what's inside. Come on, let's go. Hello, everybody. I'm here with Hunter Ohanian, the executive director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And he's going to talk to us a little bit today about the museum and all their collection here and what is exactly included in the archives of the Stonewall Museum. First, let's say hello. Hello, Hunter. How are you? I'm good, Charles. How are you? Thank you so much for being here. Well, it's an honor that you have us here today to take a look at the behind the scenes of this amazing museum. Tell us a little bit about the history of the Stonewall Museum and Archives. When it was founded and, and what's contained in the, um, in, the, in the stacks of books? Sure. Well, we were founded almost 50 years ago, and a gentleman by the name of Mark Silber uh, lived in Hollywood, Florida. And he, was a, he grew up in New York, but his family moved uh, to Hollywood, and he was a young gay man at, at the time decided that he was going to create a library or a collection of LGBTQ books. And so in his bedroom in Hollywood, Florida, he started buying books like Giovanni's Room and, uh, and City in the Pillar, and he started creating this small co collection. What he started with, with just a shelf of books about, about this big, is now 28,000 volumes of books. The facility is probably about 4,600 square feet. Um, it is believed to be the largest lending library of LGBTQ uh, books in the world. Um, people come in every day to take books out. They take out DVDs. There are art books over here, fiction, nonfiction. It's all um, classified and uh, ca categorized under the Library of Congress system. And actually, our entire um, catalog system is available online through our website at stonewall-museum.org. Tell us a little bit about your history and your background with the museum. How did you become the executive director? Sure. I have a very uh, checkered past. Um, I <laughs> Uh, I went to undergraduate school at Boston College, and then I went to law school. And uh, so I practiced law for probably 10 or 15 years. But then uh, my husband Jeffrey and I um, decided to move to P Provincetown, and I started running nonprofit organizations in my mid-30s. And so I was very fortunate to run some uh, rather well-known, prestigious artist residency programs. But about a decade ago, I was asked to come to New York, and um, I was the first museum director at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Gay and Lesbian Art in New York. And so my challenge there was to bring the organization to a accreditation, and that was a wonderful challenge. And so um, my husband and I have had a place here in South Florida for a while, and we decided to come here and live here full time. And I saw that the position of executive director was open here, and so I said I would be interested. And, and so I've been here for, for a year, and it's been a wonderful ch challenge. It's really so we really do three separate things here. We have a lending library, and I say, as I say, there are 28,000 volumes in the library, fiction, nonfiction, biography, um, art books. And then also behind the scenes in the library, we have a number of special collections. So for example, we have hundreds of first edition books, uh, books signed by the author of early historic uh, gay novels. So um, Oscar Wilde or Walt Whit Whitman or uh, all of those. Now those are not available for circulation, but those are being pre preserved here. Um, so in addition to the library, we then have an archive. And so what the archive is, is really it's a collection of objects and papers which represent gay history primarily from 1950 to the present day. And we'll get a chance to go in there and see some of the archives in a little while. We have 2,700 linear feet, which to me didn't mean very much, but that's actually all the way up one side of the Empire State Building and all the way down the other. In total, it's about six million pages of gay history, whether it's trans or, 
or bondage or lesbian or feminism or socialism or urban areas, um, uh, uh, rural areas. It, go, it, it, has, it runs the entire gamut. Of- Do you have a personal favorite in the collection? I don't. <laughs> and I think for me, what I find really intriguing about it is the depth of the different areas. And also, what I find intriguing is the fact that when Stonewall ha- happened in 1969, and then in the ne- 1970s, how gay rights really blossomed, there were so many publications that were available for, for people. So no matter what your particular interest was, there was a way that you could connect with other like-minded individuals. And of course- Now you're preparing a new exhibition I saw when we walked in. Tell us a little bit about that exhibition and when it will open and when people who are here in the area or people visiting could come and see it. Sure. So we the exhibitions that we do now, we have two exhibition spaces here, two, two separate gallery walls. And what we do is we take things from the archives and then we display those around a common theme. theme. So right now there's a show called Life Letters, which are really about expressions of love between members of the LGBTQ community. So you'll see an original letter from somebody who was incarcerated in prison and making artwork for his boyfriend outside of prison. Or you'll see a letter from Tennessee Williams talking about the problems that he was having with his lover. Or somebody receiving telegrams from their mother in, in 1969 when they performed in the Jewel Box Review for the first time at the Apollo Theater. And so it's a very sentimental show. Um, and then the show that will be opening in the beginning of December, uh, d- December 4th, is called Queers at Home. And it's a look at gay domestic life. And so we look at marriage, we look at family, we look at interiors, we look at sort of the normalcy of what a lot of people have in their home life. And so we've taken a lot of things out of the archives and put those, we'll be putting those on the walls. And also I wanna to say too, what's important about this is it's not just the physical, the, the, the four walls of the building that we, that we reside. We also look at the neighborhoods because for many gay individuals, the neighborhood, whether it's the West Village or West Hollywood or Boys Town in Chicago, those are important places that people, that gay people certainly have felt at home in those neighborhoods. Tell us a little bit about your programs for people. You have, um, I believe Jeffrey recently started a play reading series. Are there other group activities that people who are in the community can come and participate in? What sort of things do you offer? Sure. Um, thank you for mentioning my husband, Jeffrey George. Hi, Jeffrey. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so as any public library or um, educational institution, a major part of what we do is engage the public. So for long, for a long time, we've had book clubs and um, d- different groups. Uh, actually, before COVID, we had um, a a group of individuals who would come in here and it was almost like their own antiques roadshow. There, there would be 10 of them and they would bring in, it wouldn't have to be gay, but one person would bring in a painting or somebody would bring in a sword and they would have a conversation about what that was about. So cool. We have book clubs now that meet uh, online through Zoom. We have, as you say, a gay theater group, which meets online. We have a gay film group, which meets uh, online. And to join any of those, all we ask is somebody become a member. Membership is $35 of the library, and then you can join any of those groups. Why don't you take us on a little tour behind the scenes, and you could show us the... um, what do they call them stacks or in, in a yeah stacks is a good uh, stacks is a good good word uh they're b- bookcases they're sh- shelving units you can see w- when we go in there you'll see that you have to w- wind them to move them because they're hundreds and hundreds of pounds in e- each of those so let's go t- take a look we'll take a look behind the scenes at the stonewall national museum and archives in fort lauderdale here we go so uh, w- this is the inside of the archive, as we t- talked about. And so this is actually what six million pieces of paper lo- look like of gay history. And so here you have serials. Uh, you can just look right down here. And you have, these are most of the publications uh, from around it, the United States. Things like the Mattachine Re- Review, to Outlook, to Out, um, Outlook magazines, Out in Style. Um, we are just beginning a digitization pr- process now because a lot of this paper was n- never meant to last as long as it actually has. Uh, 
this is a complete collection of books about HIV and AIDS that goes back to the 1980s and the 1990s, which has misinformation in it. These titles are, have been proven to be scientifically inaccurate, and so we don't want these to be out on the shelves for somebody who zero converts to today, but it's also it's an important part of what gay male history what was about. Here you can see things about early uh, psychiatric titles about homosexuality uh, and how it was actually considered a disease. Um, this entire thing is the Anita Bryant collection. <laughs> so this is a publication um, from uh, Michigan that um, these are early, very early lesbian publications. So you can see that these are just photocopied. They're, it was just a way for them to create information and to pass it along. So there are ideas about uh, campgrounds, guest houses, vacancies. There'd be a little bit of poetry in here. So this is an example of some of the files that we have. So, of course, here's a box about Judy Garland. And, of course, you, you open it up and here you see the Renee Zellweger review uh, in the New York Times from 2019. And then you just dig a little further and here you see a Judy um, uh, jigsaw puzzle. And then you can see these beautiful mimeographed scrapbooks that somebody kept from 1964 to 1965 as a card-carrying member of the Judy Garland fan club. And so these pages were just copied and mimeographed. So Charles, thank you so much for being here and for sharing Stonewall with your audience. Um, just to remind everybody, we're here in South Florida. We're open Monday through Friday from 11 to 5 and on Saturdays from 11 to 3. You can visit us um, online at stonewall-museum.org. And remember too that all of our exhibitions are posted online and we have a great talk series that happens every week as well too. So just go to the website and you'll find out everything that's happening. Thanks Charles. I hope you like that tour of the museum. It's an amazing place. Please visit or go online and check it out and make a donation. It's a 501c3 and the end of the year is coming along, so you may want to make a tax-deductible contribution. Now this week on Facebook, I posted a picture of my friend Manny, Manny Lucia, and my dear friend Marcelino Sanchez when we were in the pajama game doing the steam heat number in high school back in 1975 at Art and Design. And I made a little bit of a challenge, which I never do on Facebook. I said, put a few pictures up of high school or grammar school when you're in a show, and I'll, I'll feature a few on the show this week. So my friend Ken Tirado sent this photo in of him and Manny in the same aforementioned show, The Pajama Game. I'll hold it up, and we can get a close-up on that, too. I'll put it up. It's Manny Lucia. She played Gladys, and I believe Ken played Prez. Now, here's a picture of the amazing Judy Wong. Judy Wong is right over here, and she's in some sort of talent variety show, I think in grammar school, with her friend Rick Roberts, who is a stand-up comedian. Now, this picture isn't dated. Oh, yes, it is. It is dated. 1857. Judy, I did not know you were that old. Anyway, thanks for watching the show. I had a great time. Whatever you do on Thanksgiving, have a happy, healthy Thanksgiving, and above all, a safe Thanksgiving. And we'll see you right here next Saturday on My Thoughts Exactly. I love you, Judy. Just kidding. Bye.